Well, good morning. It goes without saying I'm just a little uncomfortable doing this. A couple of reasons. First of all, I'm usually the guy on the other side of the camera, and I feel very uncomfortable being on this side of the camera. And secondly, I've never done this before. Uh, I've never preached to a congregation or taught or shared with a congregation, so I'm just a little bit nervous doing these things. So I have to keep telling myself, look, Fisher, just get over it and get on with ministry. So with that in mind, let's do just that and pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the grace that we have in Jesus, for the fact that he has promised in these troubling days never to leave us nor forsake us. You have given us your word, your spirit, your church to help us when life causes our emotions to go all over the place. So help us now as we study your word for your truth for our times. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when this whole coronavirus thing, uh, coronavirus thing hit uh, and it reached our shores and began to circulate even among the United States, a lot of verses flashed through my mind because I, too, was a little bit afraid. I mean, I have family and friends that are older, and um, uh, w which seems to be the target group of this thing. And rather than rehearse all of the ills of the coronavirus, which other preachers and teachers and newscasters have done very well, I thought we'd just look to the Lord for comfort this morning. And as I was thinking about that, and even as this thing was beginning and being discovered first in Montgomery County, I have a son who serves as a police officer in Montgomery County and was worried for him and his family. And verses went through my mind, verses that I have known and loved for many years. Isaiah 41.10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you to be strong and be courageous? Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. Romans 8.28, of course, is a favorite that uh, brings a, a measure of comfort, and it says that we know that for those who love God, <clears throat> all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.31 begins a beautiful section in Romans 8 that talks about God's inseparable love with believers. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And if you jump down to verse 37, it continues, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rules, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there are tons of other verses that we could go to. But one that my mind kept coming back to was one that I have cherished for decades. And it's Psalm 121. I thought it, so our time together this morning would be a, a brief break from Genesis. It would have been Genesis chapter 16, but we're going to be working with Psalm 121 this morning. I, I remember preaching this about 11 years ago, and um, I think I titled it at that time, um, What to Do When Stuff Happens, Sudden, Terrifying, Unexpected, Frightening Fixes. But this morning, I'd just like to look at the Lord and who he is and what he does for us as our keeper. Well, first of all, j just a quick word about the Psalms themselves. First, um, the Psalms are simply song lyrics that were used in worship, or uh, whether public or private. That's all they were. Uh, for some reason, the Lord chose not to inspire and record the actual music notes, even though uh, in cuneiform at around 1400, that was a possibility. But the Lord chose not to inspire the notes, but rather the words. So this literary form is ancient song lyrics. It's, it's not a didactic section like the Book of Romans. It's, it's not a historical narrative like one of the Gospels or um, the, the Book of uh, the Exodus from Egypt. It's also not prophetic. Now, the Psalms do contain some elements of those things, but the form itself is uh, lyrical poetry. Hebrew lyrical poetry. Now, Hebrew lyrical poetry, as opposed to our, in our English-speaking world, doesn't necessarily rhyme, and it doesn't necessarily have a meter, especially as we, in, as English speakers, 
uh, look through these translations that were taken from an original language which lose something into our English. So we have the truth, the words. So it's a comparison and a contrast of Bible truths and life applications. So please, in your Bibles, if you have them, and I hope you do, please turn to Psalm 121. And let's unpack the truth, the strength, and the comfort that God has packed into his word, into some of these worship songs, if you will, more than 3,000 years ago. So we can find truth to live by, to meet the needs of our hearts and the needs of our souls 3,000 years later in the light of the COVID-19 virus. Once again, the COVID-19 virus has uh, <clears throat> proven uh, that man, proud and self-assured as human beings, that life is not always predictable, pleasant, or safe. We've discovered that pretty quickly. Fortunately for the believer, however, in the midst of all of this, God has our backs. He is the one who is our keeper. You see, if Psalm 23 is, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm 121 really pictures the Lord as our keeper. Now, what comes to your mind when you think about keeper? Well, if, if you're a sports fan, a keeper might be someone who protects the goal from the opposing team from scoring, as in soccer or hockey. Uh, if you're a keeper of animals in a zoo, you're someone who protects the animals from the humans, the humans from the animals, and the animals from each other, and sometimes, unfortunately, from the humans from each other. Uh, a beekeeper, he protects and cares for the bee to, bees and harvests what they produce. A peacekeeper, a, a police officer, who protects and serves the citizenry. Uh, a lighthouse keeper, who protects the and keeps uh, functioning well the instrument that keeps ships and human lives and cargo safe at sea. Uh, even a storekeeper, who organizes and maintains a place of commerce to meet the needs of a community. So, with all those things wrapped in mind, is the Hebrew word shamar. The very first place, actually, this word shamar shows up in Scripture is in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, verse 15, rather, and the keeper there is Adam. God appoints Adam to be a keeper of the garden. All right, so this, this word shamar means to, to guard, to keep, to be careful, to pay attention, uh, uh, to protect if necessary. So the keeper is a multi-directional keeper. He protects the animals from the humans, humans from the animals, animals from each other, and sometimes, unfortunately, the humans from the humans when they act in an unruly way. The keeper has charge of a lot of things with many dynamics and dimensions. And so does the Lord. We're going to look at three things. First of all, why do I need a keeper? Well, life is uncertain. All you have to do is flip the news on. And uh, with a COVID virus right now, uh, life is uncertain as we watch the numbers rise and fall. And, and, and the numbers in various nations, it seems there are hardly any nations that are untouched by this. Thankfully, in the United States, God has seen fit to not have our numbers as high as some others. And we need to pray for the U.S. and all nations involved who are having this. But, you know, life is uncertain with change, anticipation, anxiety, danger, and fear. And, and quite frankly, viruses and plagues, though this particular one is new to us in our century, it's not new to human history. Think about it. Ever since the fall of man, there have been things like plague and famine and pestilence and war. Adam and Eve's children were, were the first to commit murder and to be murdered. Think about the place uh, when God wrought upon Israel. Uh, a plague when they were disobeying when Moses was trying to lead them through the wilderness. So none of this is new. Even before they were freed and into the wilderness, God brought plagues upon the nation of Israel, or upon Egypt, and kept the nation of Israel protected from them because the Lord was their keeper. So our need for the keeper begins in Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall come my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now, we're faced with the situation here. Psalm 120 through 134 are called the Psalm of Ascents. It, they are psalms that pilgrims used to use singing as they went up to Jerusalem 
to praise the Lord and to remind themselves of the Lord's power, because frankly, the trip wasn't all that safe. In fact, we even have here the psalmist saying, I lift up my eyes to the hills, and rather than the next phrase being to praise the Lord and great anticipation of being there, he talks immediately about help and needing help, and then he shows us where his help comes from. So the logical question of, of why is because the mountains themselves were not the place of refuge. The mountains themselves were a place of danger. And if you think about it, it makes a whole lot of sense. First, there's the terrain. Then robbers could be hidden in any parts of those terrain. Then there were animals and snakes and lions and bears and scorpions and all the rest. Then there were even places where apostate Jews or, or cults would hide and attack people walking through various trade routes. Remember, we're talking about the ancient days when safety was not something that could be guaranteed to any traveler. So I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Maybe we could even rephrase it. I'm not into rewriting scripture, but maybe rephrase it this way. I lift my eyes to the mountains with great anxiety and fear. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. All right. Now the psalmist goes on to tell us where his help does come from. In verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Who is my keeper? That's the question verse 2 answers. The keeper is identified as the Lord as creator. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 23 says, in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and mountains. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, some boast in chariots, some boast in horses, but we will boast in the Lord our God. That kind of mental attitude and trust and faith shows up in David's life when Jesse's runt of a litter of seven, the, the freckle-faced, red-haired kid, faces a nine-foot giant in the name of the Lord with a staff, a sling, and five stones. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the Lord is his keeper. You know, in this worldwide war and a killer germ, we need to remember who is stronger, greater, and has more authority. The Lord our God or a microscopic life form. Not that it's not powerful, not that it can't do great damage, but the Creator Himself is far more powerful. For the believer in Jesus to place his security in his well-being and his circumstances or the powerful resources of a modern medicine alone is a huge mistake. Now, no offense and, uh, to all of the efforts and the scientists and the medical personnel and the hospitals and the pharmaceutical companies and the health and welfare centers and the masks and the vaccines. They're all wonderful resources, but they make lousy gods. God is the one who can override all these things and just simply put a stop to it. The Lord is the only one fully qualified, really, to be our keeper from anything that would threaten us in life. The Lord is the able keeper because he is the creator of heaven and earth. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke a word and matter came into existence. He reorganized that matter and brought life out of lifelessness. Certainly, he can rule over a virus. Then, what does this keeper do? Look at verses 3 through 8. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil, and he will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. First, look at verse 3. He steadies my feet. Verse 3 says, he will not let your foot be moved. Now, remember I said, in Hebrew poetry, word pictures abound. He steadies my feet on the path. Just recently, we had a funeral in very cold weather, and I went out to the car um, to get something from it. I, I can't remember whether I was getting something from it or trying to get into the funeral, get ready to be in the funeral procession. But I remember not seeing a small patch of ice, probably no bigger than my Bible. It looked black, just like the blacktop. I hit it and went down like a ton of bricks. 
My legs slid underneath the car, my elbows smashed on the macadam, my knee banged into the door, and I thought, oh, if I had only been paying attention, I would have had much surer footing and overstepped that piece of ice. But in our walking through life, as we let the Lord's be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, God is the one who steadies our feet. You know, you think to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 6 when he's speaking about the armor of God. Paul's looking at the Roman soldier and looking at his armament and making, again, some Hebrew poetry parallels. And he comes to the soldier's shoes, shod with a gospel of peace. Now, the soldier's shoes were cleated, much like an athlete's shoe or even a soldier's shoes today. They are not smooth so that he might have sure footing in the battlefield. The Lord is the one who causes our feet to be steady. 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 9 says, He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall man prevail. Proverbs 3, uh, verse 21 and 23 says, My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and description. They will be life to your soul, adornment for your neck, and then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. He causes our feet to stand firm in the gospel, the truth that saves our souls. The second thing that we notice in verse 3 is that God is always on duty. Now, here again, we're going to a, a, a figure of speech, a metaphor, a word picture. It says, He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now, notice in that phrase, it's actually, sleeping is actually mentioned two times and emphasized the second time. Anytime the scriptures repeat something, especially in such close proximity, it's always for emphasis. You will not slumber. Uh, the word is to be drowsy or, or to sleep. And, and the second word, um, yashen, is to actually sleep. In other words, out cold. You, you are uh, sleeping and maybe snoring, and, but you are not conscious to the world. You see, God is the keeper that never sleeps on duty. He, he is the guard that doesn't have to worry about uh, being caught sleeping on duty because he never does. Now, how does that even work? I mean, no human being can do that and not sleep uh, 24-7, 365. That's just not possible, but then we're not God. Even in the animal kingdom, think about it. Um, I learned that whales and dolphins, what do they do? Do they go to sleep? And if they do, how do they breathe? because they can only stay submerged for 20, 30 minutes at a time. Well, I've, I did a little research, and whales and dolphins actually sleep without drowning by continuing to move and shutting half their brain down. I know it sounds strange, uh, but according to uh, the uh, Bruce Hecker, director of husbandry at South Carolina Aquarium in Charleston, South Carolina, what actually happens is these dolphins shut half of their brain down and uh, completely asleep, but their opposite eye is still awake and open, but yet working at lesser capacity. And then after a certain period of time, the process reverses for them to allow their brains to rest almost half at a time. My wife asked me one time when I was behind the wheel of a car, she said, are you still sleepy? I said, no, I'm doing the whale thing. And she goes, you're doing what? I said, yeah, I'm just closing my one eye and letting that half of the brain go to sleep. And she, she did not receive that well. So I just told her, no, I was just kidding. And we just kept awake while we went our way on the car. But you see, God doesn't do that. And what he's basically saying is God pays attention 100% of the time to his beloved. What more can you want from a keeper? His eyes never go off the monitor, so to speak. His eye is always on us. In fact, in verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Again, we're back into these word pictures. Um, it's kind of funny. I mean, we, we all understand what it is to be smitten by the sun during the day. You get sunburn, possibility of heat stroke. I remember visiting Amy in Southeast Asia. And Amy was like a mother hen when we were there. She kept asking us questions because of the heat of the sun. Um, uh, when was the last time you had some water? Drink some now. 
Uh, well, that made sense, and I, I was hot, I, I was thirsty. But how do you feel? And she meant, are you feeling dizzy? Or are you going to be sick? Do you feel flushed? Uh, do you have a headache? Uh, do you have an altered mental state or behavior? I said no to all of the previous ones, but the last one I told her she'd have to ask somebody else. I, and it would depend on who she asked about my mental state being altered. And then finally, she said, Pastor, walk closer to the buildings. Stay in the shade and get out of the sun. And that made sense, but I just never thought to do that, because who in Pennsylvania does that? But as I noticed when she said that, all of the people on those islands were walking very close to the buildings in the shade because the sun was so intense. I think on that particular day, it was 110 with 90% humidity, and it was a little bit before noon. Um, so I, I understand the protection of the sun and that metaphor that's being used, but what does this mean? from the moon by night. I mean, I've never even heard of a moon burn. That doesn't make any logical sense. Again, the psalmist is being poetic. What he's saying is this. It doesn't matter whether it's day or night. God is the keeper of us 24-7. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. Day or night does not matter to him. He is always our keeper protecting us all the time. And then he protects our lives from evil, it says in verse 7. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The word here for evil is raw. It's just a general word for evil. It could mean bad circumstance. It could mean evil in the sense of as opposed to God. Uh, but in Psalm 91, in verse 10, it says, No evil, same word, will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Again, that's a prophecy about the Christ, uh, that God would protect him until his time on earth was over. But what kinds of evil does the Lord protect us from? All kinds. Think about it. Those Christians who are persecuted, who are injured, and who even die, we lose people all the time to death because it's part of the curse upon the human race. But if adversity, hurt, or injury comes, and it is stopped, it is stopped because the Lord, our keeper, sets limits. All you have to do is read the first two chapters of, of the book of Job, or uh, read that section in Luke 22, 31 to 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You see, God sets limits. He is in control. Whatever happens in our lives is by the permissive or the decretive will of God. God doesn't wake up in the morning and, and, and say to himself, ooh, I didn't see that coming. That's not part of his uh, life. He is the one who causes all things to work together to good according to his purposes. He also protects my life forever. Psalm 121, 7 and 8 say, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. That's from the ESV. Now, the NASB, if you're using that, says, The Lord will keep your soul. Now, the Hebrew word is nefesh, and it can mean either and both at the same time. It's not talking about the Lord only keeping uh, the, the circumstances of our lives are only keeping our eternal soul. I think he does both at the same time, always. That Hebrew word, nefesh, can be used in that direction. You see, God is concerned about the entirety of my life and your life. He's concerned with things physical, material, non-physical, and immaterial. The eternal soul, in which was made in his image, all of it he is concerned about. Because we are, his we are his by creation and his by redemption. You see, God owns us twice. And he will protect his investment, so to speak, because he spent so much on us. His blessed son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And Jesus himself says about God's protection and our value before him. Do not fear those who kill the body, he says in Matthew chapter 10 but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in heaven. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. 
but even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now concerning our eternal souls, God considers them so important, he seals them with the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 tell us. You see, we are locked up in the power of his hand. Listen to the way Jesus phrases God's power in keeping his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I will give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one will snatch them from the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The most important part of man, the eternal soul, for which Christ died, is kept safe for all eternity, from all harm, by none other than God himself. And then lastly, he says, he guards my travels. Look at verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The going out and the coming in to and from Jerusalem. The going out in maybe, in, in maybe our circumstances of, of going out and coming in from our homes to work or school or, uh, uh, or to places of worship. Basically, he's saying wherever you go, God will be with you, fulfilling his role as the keeper. He is the one who will guard our going out and coming in. Does that mean that we'll never have a traffic accident, break a leg, or suffer from some sickness, or the separation from a beloved church, or a pastor, or even death itself? No. But it does mean that when protection, provision, and deliverance is needed by us, and decreed by God, God himself will accomplish it, because he is our keeper. Let me just read to you this poem. I really like this poem by Gibbs Vall. It's called uh, The Parable of Tomorrow. I looked at the mountains. It's too hard, I said. I cannot climb. Take my hand, he whispered. I'll be your strength. I saw the road. It's too rough and long, Lord. Take my love, he answered. I'll guard your feet. I looked to the sky, and the sun is gone. I said, already... The way grows dark. Take the lantern of my word, he whispered, and that will be light enough. Well, we climbed, and the road was narrow and steep, but the way was bright, and when the thorns reached out, they found his hand before they touched my own. And when my path grew rough, I knew it was his love that kept my feet from stumbling. Then I grew very tired. I can go no further, Lord. And he answered, Night is gone. Look up, my child. And I looked, and it was dawn, and green valleys stretched below. I can go on alone now, I said. And then I saw the marks. Lord, you're wounded. Your hands are bleeding. Your feet are bruised. Was it for me? He whispered, I did it gladly. And then I fell at his feet. Lord, lead me on, I cried. No road too long, no valley too deep, if you're with me. And we walk together and shall forever. Psalm 21 is a beautiful psalm. So let me just give you two things to take with you. First, you need a keeper, just like I need a keeper. Because life is uncertain and filled with change, and especially in the light of COVID-19. Don't let the evil one steal your sense of comfort and security in Christ. Remember who your keeper is. So, my dear brother and sister in Christ, rest your weary, worried heart, mind, body, and spirit in Jesus. And then secondly, just one more thing. Resting in the secure hand of our divine keeper keeps us from being paralyzed from doing what God wants us to do while we walk this earth. See, he wants us to minister for him. He wants us to do things that would glorify him. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all those in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Don't let this virus paralyze. You're doing things for one another your friends, your neighbor, your family. Now, 
It means we need to take the proper precautions. We need to listen to the instructions of our government. But we can still minister to other people and not even leave our own homes. Or keep such limited contact we don't put ourselves or others at risk. Let your light shine. But do it knowing that the Lord's your keeper. All right, let's just pray together before we leave. Heavenly Father, we need you. You're our keeper. And we can rest assured in that. There is no place on the planet we can go and you won't be there. You won't be there before we arrive. That you will be there before we arrive. You'll be there when we're there and you'll be there when we leave. And at the same time, travel with us to the next place. Protecting us, guiding us all the way. Please, give to us that peace and comfort that only the Keeper can give. And then, Father, please, in these days, and maybe weeks ahead, hopefully not months, remind us when we're watching the news, when somebody in our family needs help, or our neighborhood, or our church. Help us to be cautious and careful, but not to be crippled with fear knowing that our Keeper goes before us so that He might be glorified in all things. Help us, Lord, we pray, by Your Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen.